And now, a special presentation of Wood Chopping Time. Hello, fellow wood chopperoos. Chad here, and I'm with Safety Dan. Hey. Recently, I was asked to give a presentation for the Society of American Period Furniture Makers. The subject, Chippendale style furniture. Now, we didn't exactly have our camera rolling, but I did get some footage of the presentation. We did our best in editing to give it to you today. Now, I know what you're thinking. This isn't what you've come to expect from wood chopping time. But at the same rate, this is why you like watching Wood Chopping Time. So sit back, relax, and learn a thing or two about the history, the culture, that makes this iconic furniture worth learning about. I hope you enjoy it. I did volunteer for the subject here on, on Chippendale. And uh, when, I, when I did so, I actually told Ed that I, I don't really know much about Chippendale. And Ed said to me, he goes, well, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Or maybe he said, you better learn a lot. <laughs> but at any rate, so yeah, like, like any good person excited to do their uh, report and lesson, I went out and hit the streets and I, you know, asked the friends and neighbors about uh, Chippendale and that's what I learned. <laughs> um, and so I, I was, yeah, I was, I was all ready to do a presentation on this, and uh, Ed was just talking to me there, and he told me Chippendale was a uh, style of furniture. That kind of makes more sense for you guys now. Than... <laughs> so at this point, I'm just going to have to wing it, so bear with me. At the beginning, I think when Ed said we were running a little uh, short on time and that, and I think John said, well, ask a lot of questions. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> so, it, if you if you got a question, just keep it to yourself, <laughs> or you can ask Dan here. So, um, <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> there was a lot of different regions to talk about, so I narrowed it down to uh, Boston, Philadelphia, Rhode Island, New York. Um, there was. New England, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maryland, Virginia, the Carolinas. Uh, that's just too much, so I just tried to do a little uh, brief highlight on those regional differences. Now, before I actually get into showing the features of the different regions, it was important for me to kind of learn what was happening at the time in, in our country for this furniture to develop. So as, as we learned just before Chippendale style, we had the Queen Anne. And during that time in America, things were going pretty well. You know, our 13 colonies were formed. Uh, we were still kind of getting along with Britain. So that kind of reflected the look of that style furniture. But times, times were changing. In July 1755, the French and Indian War. It was actually the French and Britain were fighting. And it went all the way from Nova Scotia all the way down to Virginia. Uh, it lasted seven years. Uh, we also had, in 1764, the Sugar Act uh, took place. And that's, this was a high tax on, obviously, sugar. And also in this tax, they made it so you could only export lumber to Britain. And I'm sure Britain got a pretty good price on it, too. So there, there was tension over that. In fact, uh, Sam Adams protested this. He stopped importing these items in uh, from Britain and uh, violence actually broke out in Rhode Island. And that was new to me because I thought Sam Adams was just a beer. You know? <laughs> so we have a historical figure in this as well. So, um, we had the, 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 the Stamp and Quarterly Act. So the Stamp was Act was all paper that was being produced, newspapers, magazines, books, could only come from a special place in London that had the stamp on it. Uh, the Quarterly Act was also said because there were so many troops occupying in, in Boston that they were like, well, you got to start housing the, the troops. So this was causing a lot of tension. 1770, Boston Massacre, where five protesters were killed. And then 1773, the Boston Tea Party, 
All this is leading up, obviously, to the American Revolution. There was all other kinds of taxes going on, too. I mean, there was the Townstead Act, Quebec Act, Navigation Act, the Tolerable Act. So you could feel the tension that was at the time, and this was shaping things. But at any rate, with this, with this going on, independence was coming and also inspiration. And this was shown by the furniture. The, the craftsmen showed their, their inspiration in the style of Chippendale. So Chippendale was really comprised, comprised of three different styles, the Rococo, the Gothic, and the Chinese. I could have one. Dang it. What did I tell you? No questions, Bill. No questions. I, I, I believe it's French. Is that correct? French? I think that's where it's coming from. But. So what I read, um, part, of, part of the style was the, um, the carved shells, the scrolls. The Gothic offered the pointed arches. Trefoils and quarterfoils. You know, when I saw this dinette set, I mean, that is, to me, that is like really ugly, these chairs. I just keep thinking like the cone heads from Saturday Night Live, that this was in their house. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, of course, the Chinese style, where it used the Pagoda style seat crests and then the fretwork that was on. All, all three of those are kind of combined into the Chippendale style. So the gentleman and cabinet maker's director, this is from, obviously, Thomas Chippendale. This book was really unique uh, in its time. What it did was it allowed uh, craftsmen or uh, potential clients to browse through it and pick the different features that they liked. In fact, um, you can see like on these chairs, they show one leg and an apron that's flat on one side and then a larger leg or a decorated apron on the other, giving the client or the craftsman the option to choose uh, these things. He wasn't the first to do this, though. Uh, there was other people in London that actually did more work um, with furniture than Thomas Chippendale. We had William and John Lindell, and Robert Adams actually sold more furniture in London. But Thomas Chippendale was the best at promoting it. And at one time in London, he had 90 cabinet makers, 20 upholsters, 10 carvers, 9 joiners, 4 carpenters, and a partridge in a pear tree <laughs> that all subscribed to his book. Uh, it wasn't until the 19th century that Wright and Manfield coined the phrase Chippendale style furniture. So the book makes its way to the colonies. And when it comes, the sales were really low in Boston and Newport. This is kind of one of the regions that, that make it different, the styles. It sold really well in Philadelphia and New York, but not so much in Boston and Newport. And, and one of the reasons then was because Boston had a really uh, slow growth rate. And the craftsmen then chose to rather just do feature, uh, a new feature on their furniture than pick up a whole new style. We're going to dive now into what are some of the features of Chippendale. Of course, the most iconic feature would be the ball and claw foot. The ball and claw spanned from 1710 to 1740 in England, and its popularity was at its peak in 1720s. But then it, it kind of grew out of style or out of fashion uh, in England because they were going with the French Rococo. The ball and claw made its way in Boston. Uh, the first piece was seen in, in 1730. The ball and claw actually was something that the craftsmen really not only liked the look of, but they loved what it represented. The ball was actually supposed to be a pearl. And the pearl represented uh, wisdom, truth, and purity. The claw is a dragon's claw, and it's protecting the pearl from the forces of evil. It sounds like a Lord of the Rings movie coming or something. But that was the, the symbol behind it, or the reason behind it. And what's really interesting is nowhere in this book 
does the ball and claw appear uh, in the whole book? And in, uh, while well, I impress Dan, <laughs> it feels so good, Dan, oh man. <laughs> um, actually, right in the beginning of the book, uh, Thomas Chippendale, he, he, he mentions the fact that uh, there's some designs in there that need improvement and that the uh, craftsman or the client could change them. And he felt there was enough inspiration in the book for it to be uh, you know, expanded upon. And Americans really took that to heart. So since, since the ball and claw first formed or first showed up in Boston, uh, that's where I'm going to start with some of these regional differences. Uh, now, let me go on by saying that the things I'm pointing out here, of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, in this case, Boston used the thinner rails and had thinner uh, knees on the chairs, so they felt the need for the, the stretchers on them. But I know someone's going to say, but Chad, there's a lot of Boston chairs that don't have stretchers. I know. <laughs> I'm just merely relating what, what they felt was the reason at the time. So Here's a close-up of the leg, the Boston leg still. We can tell that the, the carving looks kind of flat on it. And what was really kind of characteristic to the Boston ball and claw is the, the third claw actually kind of rakes backwards, yeah. So here's, here's a kind of a breakdown of some of the construction of it. Uh, Boston used very uh, square <laughs> legs in the back. The joint there was reinforced with a one-piece hardwood on it. Boston also liked to use the shells. The shells were used a lot in Boston and the other northern colonies. Uh, they also would usually have a uh, flat pilaster here, uh, and they liked the, the fretwork quite a bit. And of course, uh, Boston is infamous for its Bombay chest. Well, that's part one of our presentation on Chippendale-style furniture. Well, why wasn't I in that? Um, you're going to be in the second half. Okay, well, can you go get some more beer or something? Yeah, why don't you dance for us, Dan? Okay. <laughs> Just kidding.